All right. Well, it's ex it's great to be back. You know, it's it's uh, I've been out for a while. It's nice to be back. It's nice to sing the hymns again. It's nice to be in church among God's people. Very exciting. I'm glad to be back. Um, <clears throat> so I, you know, let's just get right into it. So Sunday, you know, Brother Carter and Brother Devin preached two great sermons, and I really enjoyed those sermons. I always learn something real good when they preach, and I really look up to those guys, and it's, it's nice to hear them preach. But it kind of reminds me of, I don't know if any of you have ever been in a combat sport, like boxing, MMA, kickboxing, Muay Thai. You know, sometimes when you're in a sport like that, you'll have um, friends that you build in the gym. And you build these friendships, and then you'll have guys that come out from other gyms, so other gyms from other parts of the town will come over, and they try to spar. But, you know, it's not really your typical sparring. They're coming over to get their guys ready to fight. So you're pretty much having an unsanctioned fight. So it kind of reminds me, you know, with Brother Carter and Brother Devin preaching, it's kind of like them sparring. And I'm watching, I'm just like excited. Like, come on, coach, let me in. So it's nice to have, you know, it's nice to have Pastor Burgess give me the call and allow me to get in. So I'm going to spar tonight, okay? And, and hopefully I don't get knocked out tonight, okay? So we'll... We'll get right into this. Let's just go ahead and I just want to go over, I know we read the whole, the whole chapter. I just want to go over the text that I want us to focus on. Look at John, uh, look at verse number four. It says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. You notice Jesus Christ is using abide over and over and over. Jesus is going to use this nine times. So if you have a red letter edition Bible, this whole chapter is Jesus speaking. Let's continue. Verse number five says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Now let's just stop there for a second. Sometimes we can just read through passages, and, and like we're doing this Bible memory challenge, and we've already gotten to this part of the Bible, we probably just read it, didn't really think much by it, just skimmed by it. But let's just, for a second, look at verse number 5 again. It says, I am the vine. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus says, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. You are the branches, right? He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Right? We know in Scripture, talking about bringing forth much fruit, it's us bringing people to Christ. So, what Jesus is saying here is, hey, if you're abiding in me and, you, and I in you, you're going to bring forth much fruit. Amen. Then notice what Jesus says right here at the end of that verse. For without me, ye can do nothing. You see that? Now, do you believe that, what the Bible says? He says, without me, ye can do nothing. So explain to me how we can have people that are pastors that can stand up and say, that Judas Iscariot can get somebody saved. Explain that to me. Tell me when Judas Iscariot had Jesus abiding in him. Did not Jesus say that he selected them twelve and one of you is a devil? Huh? And then it said right after that in the next verse, and he spake about Judas Iscariot. Right? So where do people get the idea? When has the devil ever abided with Jesus Christ? Never. So Judas never brought anyone to Christ. But lest you think, don't know who I'm talking about, let me just call this false prophet out by name. His name is Manly Perry. Okay? This guy has said, hey, Judas Iscariot, he's a superstar Christian. That's what he said of his own mouth. He's, the reason why he claims that Judas Iscariot is a superstar Christian is because the, the apostles couldn't figure out that he was the, the devil. That was going to betray him. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Look, the Bible says that we beget other people to Christ. That's what the Bible says. The Bible, the, believing in something like that is just as dumb as believing in evolution. Everything comes after its own kind. Only a soul winner is going to bring forth fruit. Only someone that's abiding in Christ is going to bring forth fruit. Oh, why? But wait a minute. You called this guy's name. Why did you call his name? Look, Paul did it. Did Paul not call out uh, Hamanaeus and Alexander? 
Didn't he say he was going to deliver them unto Satan? Come on, you're a pastor. You should be dividing, um, dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And he said, well, you know what? I can't prove it from the Bible. I can't prove it from the Bible that Judas got more... more uh, um, he brought forth more fruit than the rest of the disciples. If you can't prove it, then shut up. Then don't stand up behind the pulpit and say it. Okay, let's continue. I just wanted to nail that down while we, while we went ahead and read by it. Look at, uh, look at verse number 6. It says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. This isn't talking about losing your salvation. This is basically saying, hey, if you're not going to go out and abide in Christ and bear forth fruit, you're a useless Christian. You're better off to just be tossed to the side and burn. Okay? If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that may your joy, or my, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Okay, so you notice here the blessings that we have if we abide in Christ. Do you notice that? Look at verse number 7 again. It says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Do you believe your Bible? Jesus is saying here, if you abide in me and I in you, you could ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. If you're walking in Christ, and Christ is walking in you, you're in God's will. When you ask for something, God will give it to you. That's a blessing. That's, that's awesome. How about the fact that Jesus calls you his friend? How beautiful is that? We just, read, we just sung that song, Commune Friend with Friend. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. Amen. Right? But you know what? If I'm honest, we don't always abide in Christ. There comes times where we're not here. We want to be, but there are times that we're not here. So what I want to preach on tonight is abiding in Christ and doing the right thing, but it's also the first step to backsliding. If we can identify that first step to backsliding, we'll know the rest that follows. We will not have to do the second, third, fourth, fifth step. So that's what I'm going to preach on. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you fill me with your spirit, Father, as I come up here and preach, Father. Lord, I pray that you have me say what you want me to say, Lord, and not what I want to say, Father. Lord, I want to abide in you. And let us just sit here and listen to your words being preached, Father, and give me the power and the authority to be able to preach it with boldness, Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. As Christians, we are called to continue to grow in Christ. The way we can abide in Christ is if we're continuing to grow in Christ. See, God wants us to be more committed to Him today than we were yesterday. God wants us to have more Bible knowledge this week than we did last week. God wants us to have a deeper prayer life this month than we did last month. God wants us to be a better soul winner now than we were when we first started. God wants us to have more Bible committed to memory this year than we did last year. You know, shout out to Brother Devin, okay? Look, God wants us to continue to grow, all right? 
He wants us to grow. He wants us to continue to move forward. He doesn't want us to get stagnant. But you know what? Sometimes the newness wears off. Right? You know, we're in the month of January. This is the time where people do New Year's resolutions. Right? And like 99% of the time, the New Year's resolutions are always carnal ones. Like, hey, I want to lose some weight. Hey, I want to get on a diet. Hey, I want to... But they never do spiritual ones. Barely ever. I, I was talking to Brother Brian about this the other day. I said, look, I have a New Year's resolution. I have a spiritual New Year's resolution. My resolution is to grow more this year than I have in my entire Christian walk. And I know to do that, I have to really consume the Word of God. So I was talking to Brother Brian about this, and I said, look, man, I got a 45-minute commute to work. I'm going to commit my 45-minute commute to listening to the Bible. And then I have an hour commute back home after work, thanks to traffic. So I'm going to commit 15 minutes to that. So that's an hour. If I can listen to my Bible every single day for the rest of the year, I can get through my Bible four times in a year. And then we have a Bible, memory, or a Bible uh, reading challenge that we're doing this month. If I do that again in the month of July... In the remainder of the months, I just go ahead and do the Old Testament, read through the Old Testament. I can get through the Bible twice, reading it cover to cover with no problems. That's a total of six times. That's a lot of Bible. Okay? But hey, that's my New Year's resolution. Okay? Okay? Look, here's the thing. We need to continue to abide in Christ. We need to continue to do what's right. You know, when we first became Christians, we didn't know what was right. We had no idea. We had to learn. So was, I'm going to go over three points. I'm taking, I'm taking some pointers from Brother Carter, and I'm, I organized my sermon into three points, okay? <laughs> so point number one for me is doing right must be learned. Doing right must be learned. Turn to Isaiah 53 for me. All right, church, doing right must be learned. Let me ask you this. Was it easy for you to start tithing? Was it easy for you to decide to give God 10% of your income that you worked for? Was that easy? Is that something that came easy to you? I'm going to go ahead and just confess my faults unto you. It was not easy for me. Okay? When I, was, I, when I first got saved, I started going to a non-denom church, okay? I was excited. I wanted to learn about God. I was going to this church, and the, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to every single church service. But come to find out, this non-denom church was kind of like these, one of these mini mega churches. So it wasn't like a Joel Osteen super church, but it was a mini one. It, had, it was like victory. We have a church right down the road. It's a non-denom church. It's a big church. That's kind of the church I was going to. I could probably walk into Victory with my eyes closed and know how to get around. Okay, because they're all kind of cut out the same. They all have a coffee shop. They all have a smoothie sandwich bar. They all have a bookstore. Right? They have all these, these stuff, but it's all the same. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to every single service. When I get to the second service, it's exactly the same as the first. Every single sermon is the same the only thing they do is they change the time. And they change the time to make it convenient for people that work that could go to church, but they only have one service. So I wasn't going to grow there, so I decided to go to a Bible study. I'm going to this Bible study. Everyone's reading different Bibles. I'm not really learning anything. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tithe. I know I have to tithe. I know I have to go to church. I'm going to tithe. So I was like, you know what, but I want God to know I'm serious. So I'm going to give God $100. That's what I'm going to do. So I pulled out $100. Now, this was more than my 10%, okay, at the time. And I, so I said, I wanted to show God I was committed. So I, I, but I said, you know what? I don't want to do it in front of everybody. Because I didn't know if I was going to do it. So, okay? So I did it on a Tuesday. The bookstore kept the church open seven days a week. So I went on a Tuesday or some off day. And I get in there, and they have these electronic kiosks where you can put in your debit card and your credit card. But I was going to give God cash money, all right? So I came in with my cash, and they had these, like, pillars in the middle of the church. 
are in the middle of the church, good night, in the middle of the lobby of the church, which is like the size of a football field. And they had like five of them or whatever in the middle of that church. So they had a little slot where you can stick your tithe in there, your check, you know, your envelope or whatever. So I am up there and I'm sticking it in the slot and I'm, and I'm holding on to it and I'm pulling it out and I'm sticking it in and I'm pulling it out. Oh, I don't want to, do I want to. I could just see, I, could, I think about it now and I could just see like the security guards in the camera room like, oh, well, check, check this guy out. Look, <laughs> look at this guy. He, he's having a hard time. And I, it was like for a minute straight. And then I'm like, no. And I just put my hand over it so there was no coming back. And then I'm like, I'm not getting that back. I'm not getting that $100 back. That's gone. See, look, what I'm trying to tell you is tithing was not something that came naturally to you. It was something that was hard. It was hard for me. It was hard. Okay? It was something that had to be learned. Okay? How about being honest? Is being honest something that came naturally to everybody? In a society that we live in today where everybody just go ahead and lies and nobody says anything about it. They just, they lie, and then and the funny thing is those same people that lie will tell you, oh, I hate liars. I can't stand liars. And then you're like, what? And then you catch them in a lie, and you're like, hey, you know, that's a lie. Well, you know, it's just a little one. You know, it's just a little lie. It's not a big deal. Because they try to reason in their head to say, hey, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a little lie. L let me just inform you that, hey, the Bible says that that little lie will send you to hell. And if you don't know that, the Bible says, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So that little lie is enough to send you to hell. Look, you had to learn to be honest. It wasn't something that just came to you naturally. I mean, ask anybody in here with kids. They can tell you. They can tell you. How about being content? Is being content something that came to you natural? You know, we live in a society today where everybody wants to keep up with the Joneses. They want what the other guy has. It's all about the Benjamins. It's all about the money. It's all focused on more, more, more. Huh? Look, God wants us to grow. Don't get me wrong. But he wants us to be content every step of the way. See, you had to realize that Paul, even Paul had to learn this when he said, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Paul had to learn it. You're not any more special than Paul. Right? How about being pure? How about being pure? Was that something that you had to learn? Huh? No, Pete, we know. We know that, hey, it's not right to go around with multiple partners. It's not right to go around with multiple people. It's, it's not right for a woman to be a whore. We know that already. Like, you don't have to, everybody knows that. Or do they really? Do they really know that? Do you know that there are women that are marching, screaming with their picket signs, my choice, my body? My choice, my body. They just run around there. Did you know that? Do you know what they're trying to tell you when they say that? I want my choice to murder my child so that I can go out and live a promiscuous life. That's what they're saying when they say that. They don't just want uh, freedom of choice. No, no, no. They want to murder their children so that they can go out and live a promiscuous life. Hey, to be pure, it had to be learned. Did you know that there are cultures, right? There are cultures where the men are praised for having more women. Hey, have you not heard of a ladies' man? I mean, woo, how cool is that? Being called a ladies' man. That's ridiculous. And they just get away with it. They're, oh, and you know what? In that same culture, the women have completely submitted to just say, oh, that's just the way men are. They can't be with, more than, they can't, they can't be with one person for the rest of their life. They have to be with multiple people. They, and they just get, the, the husband commits adultery, cheats on them or whatever. That's just the way he is. You don't believe there's a culture like that? Hey, you know what happens in the Latino culture? That happens in Latino culture, and I know that's not the only culture. I know it's not. All right, being pure is something you had to be learned, right? How about being a hard worker? Is that something that you had to learn? Did that come naturally to you? Huh? Just hard worker, working hard. 
You never took a longer break than you needed to? Huh? At work? Hey, 30 minutes, eh, what's an extra 15? Huh? Look, you had to learn to be a hard worker. The Bible says, right? The Bible says, <clears throat> remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor. Six days. And today we work for five days and we complain about it. Okay? And then when you read the Bible, you read the Bible, you realize those, those six days are not eight hours. Those are six legitimate days. There's 24 hours in, in a day. The whole day, 12 hours, you're put to work. Okay? We have it easy now. Okay? How about going to church? Oh, no, that one. Everyone loves going to church. How about going to church? Huh? Was that something that came natural? Church wasn't always joyous for me. It wasn't, I love being in church. I love what we're doing right now. I love being in church. I love being around God's people. It wasn't always like that for me. You want to know why I went to church? For a girl. That's why I went to church. I went to church for a girl. I said, ah, to talk to this girl, I got to go to church. And as soon as I got there, I wanted to leave. Ah, oh, this is not my crowd. Still not my crowd. It's non to nom. <laughs> All right? But I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be there. Look, I didn't, I didn't grow up. And thank God we have children in this church that are growing up in church. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't have mommy and daddy taking me to church. So that's a blessing, being in church. See, but I, let's not talk about a non denom church. It's kind of easy to go to a church like that, right? With the band, with the coffee shop, with all that. What about a church like this, where the pastor or the preacher gets up and points the finger at you? Huh? How easy is it for you to stay when the pastor's pointing and harping on your sin? When the preacher's pointing, harping on your sin? It's not easy at that point. Oh, well, you know, I don't think, no one's pointing the finger at me. You haven't been around here long enough. Stick around long enough and the finger will get pointed at you, all right? Look, my pastor, my old pastor, used to really harp on, on the Lord's Day. He used to say, hey, you need to go to church on Sunday. You need to make Sunday the Lord's Day. I think that's a great principle. You know, we don't practice the Sabbath day anymore, right? Because our rest is in Christ, right? But hey, it's still a good principle. How about we do set a day apart for the Lord? I don't have to preach it to you guys. Okay, this is the Three to Thrive crowd. This is the Wednesday night crowd. You guys, don't, I don't have to preach church to you, right? But he used to say, hey, that one day is set apart for the Lord. So you need to set a day apart for the Lord. And I'm not saying set Sunday apart for the Lord. I'm saying set a day out for the Lord. Come to church. See, he used to say, hey, you can work all six and never play, or you can play all six and never have a dime. And he's, and he's right. You know, you know there are grown men. He used to say, there are grown men that are riding their bike. We used to be at church. They are, they are riding their bike right now, this Sunday. Grown men on bikes. You just want to roll down your window and say, go to church. I mean, he's right. He wasn't lying. Look, you're probably thinking, hey, Pete, you know, honestly... I, I've been good from the beginning. I, you know, I've been honest. I've been content. I've been pure. I've been a hard worker from my youth up. Right? Oh, young rich ruler. Huh? From my youth up. Okay, okay. You're in Isaiah 53, right? Let's see how true that is. Isaiah 53. Look at verse number 6. That says there, all. Let's, let's say that together. All. Right? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep have gone astray. All of us. Let's be honest. We weren't always abiding in Christ. We had to learn to do right. Okay, we all have gone astray, the Bible says. Look, is it safe to say, with me saying that scripture, that you're selfish? Ooh, pointing the finger now. It's a little bit more uncomfortable. That you're selfish? Hey, I sit in the same category. I need this sermon just as much as you do. But according to this scripture, you're selfish. All we like sheep have gone astray. All of us. Our own way. Right? Look, it's natural to be lazy. Work must be learned. 
It's natural to complain. Contentment must be learned. Gossiping, ladies, some men, pathetic, pathetic. Gossiping, right, comes natural. Praising God must be learned. Having a temper comes natural. Temperance must be learned. Look, if my wife can say amen right now, she would. All right? Look, it's natural to have a temper. You have to learn to have temperance. You have to learn to have control of your emotions. How about pride? Look at me. Center of attention. Blah, blah. I want all the, all the attention. Why isn't anyone thinking about me? Why isn't it? Hey, humility must be learned. Right? Humility must be learned. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6 for me. And allow me to talk to the parents for a second. Oh, wait, Pete. You don't have kids. Shouldn't talk about that. You should just stick to everything else in the Bible. Wrong. Right? Hey, last time I, last time I checked, you took marriage advice from the Apostle Paul. Huh? So, look, am I preaching my words tonight? I'm preaching the Bible. And let me just let you know this. Your kids are not going to do right just because they're your kids. Right? Your kids are not going to do right just because they're your kids. They have to learn just like everybody else. See, <clears throat> hold on. Before you call me not a, not a father, okay? Look, I've brought people to Christ. I'm a spiritual daddy up here, okay? All right? Unfortunately, my kids, I don't know where they're at. But they need to be hearing daddy preach, all right? All right, well, look, Isaiah 28, 9 says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. When you teach your children, you need to teach them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That includes your spiritual kids, okay? Now, you're in Deuteronomy chapter 6, right? This was a Bible memory uh, chapter a couple years ago, I think, a couple years ago. Now, look at verse number 6. It says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them unto thy children, or they shall teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So the Bible's teaching us here, if you read the, chap the rest of that chapter, of Deuteronomy chapter 6, before that, God's giving us statutes and commandments and judgments of the Lord that we have to learn. And then he says to teach it to your children diligently. Right? When, you need to talk to them while they sit around in the house. Right? When they walk by you, when you're putting them to sleep, and when they wake up in the morning, they got to hear about God, the commandments of the Lord. Look, when I first got married to my wife, I would just constantly talk about the Bible. Constantly talk about God. She's like, oh, did you talk about anything else? Hey, honey, I'm trying to teach you. It's my job as a spiritual leader to teach you, for you to know this. So when people ask you questions, you know how to respond. Right? Look, doing right has to be learned. But this leads me into my second point. Doing right is never enjoyable at first. Doing right is never enjoyable at first. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I forgot to tell you to abide a finger in John 15. Okay? And abide a finger for me in Proverbs 16. We're going to go to Ephesians 2 first. So now you've got to have your fingers in your Bible like this. All right? Doing right is never enjoyable at first. 
Okay? Now think about this. Think about the first time you went out soul winning. You remember that? That was exciting, wasn't it? You come to a church, maybe a mega our church, or maybe a mega marathon or something, and you get paired up with your partner, and he's out there, he's very well versed in the Bible, and he's knocking every single door, and you're silent, and you're not saying anything, just quiet, right? Don't say anything, just listen to him, and he's just tearing it up. He's preaching the gospel, people are getting saved, you have three or four salvations, he's just ripping it up, he's trailblazing it out. You know, you see him going back and forth with people, they're asking questions, and he's responding, and back and forth, back and forth, and you're just in awe of that. And then you're like, I can do that. And then you get your Bible, and you fill out your little gospel presentation, and you number it, and you're ready. And next Sunday, you go to church, you say, Pastor, I'm a talker now. I'm a talker now. And he goes, good, you know. <laughs> the, we need, the harvest is, is plentiful, labors are few. Amen. Right? And you go out, and you go to the first door, and you knock, and then you say, please don't answer. <laughs> don't, don't answer this door. Don't answer. And then, for the grace of God, he doesn't, <laughs> doesn't answer. So you move on to the next door. Doesn't answer. You're like, man, God's good to me. And then you move on to the third door, and you're like, it clicks. Oh, wait a minute. I have to keep knocking until somebody answers, because this guy's not going to get a turn. Until someone answers. So then the person answers. And you're like, okay, just tell me you don't want to hear it. So my soul winning partner can go. And the soul winning partner is quiet, like he should be. And they end up listening. And then you're opening up your Bible and you're stammering through everything. And you're looking and you're like, ah, is that a two? Is that a three? What? And you don't know what you wrote down. And you're looking and you're, and you're going back and forth. The person, you're asking them a question. And you're not letting them answer it. You're like, hey, uh, what's sin? And they're, and they're like, well, and you're like, transgression of the law. And you just keep going, right? You just cut them off. And, and your soul winning partner is looking at you like, and he's doing everything in his power not to cringe. Like, oh, man. But you go through the gospel, and you get that person saved. And your soul winning partner looks at you and looks at the other person. And he goes, how did that happen? How did that happen? What in the world? Hey, it's because you were trying to abide in Christ. You were abiding in Christ and you were doing everything you could and God intervened. Person got saved. Amen. God uses us to give the gospel. And look, you're sweating. You're done. You realize you've got to go to another door. Look, what I'm trying to say, it was never enjoyable at first. When we, when we did right, it was never enjoyable at first. Right? Now, let me ask, let me just pose this question to one of the men in the church. It's a simple question, not a trick question. Why do you go soul winning? Can someone answer? Because you love the Lord. Anyone got another answer? Save the loss. Because God told us to do it. We love the Lord. We're going out to save the loss. But God commands us to do it. That's why we do it. When God commands us to do something, does it have to be fun? Does it have to be fun if God commands you to do it? Does it have to be enjoyable? No, God told you to do it. We do it because doing the right, uh, uh, doing what's right, uh, doing the right thing is, yeah. We do the right thing because it's right. That's tongue twister. We do the right thing because it's right. <clears throat> if we need to delight to do something, we're not going to do it for very long, church. We won't do it for very long. So what are you going to do when you lose the desire to come to church? What are you going to do when you lose the desire to go out soul winning? What are you going to do when you lose that desire to sing the hymns? What are you going to do when the preaching isn't as exciting anymore? Uh, not every single sermon is ripping on the side of my... Not every single sermon someone's getting up ripping on a false prophet. What are you going to do... When your walk becomes a drudgery, what are you going to do when your walk is a burden? You're tired of it. Now, this is right here. This right here is what separates the men from the boys. The women from the girls. This right here. And this is the first step to backsliding. The first step to backsliding. 
And that is doing what you want to do instead of what you should do. That is the first step to backsliding. Now, you're in Ephesians chapter 2, right? Look at verse number 10. See, we read 8 and 9 all the time. But look at verse number 10. It says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We should walk in them. So God has created us to walk in good works. That's what the Bible's saying there. That's what you should do. No, no, wait. You know, God's got a different calling for my life. God's got something else for me. God's got a different direction He wants me to go in. Okay, you're there in Proverbs chapter, you have Proverbs chapter 16, right? Turn there for me. You guys were biting a finger there. Be there. Look at, look at verse number four. It says, The Lord hath made all things. There's that word again, all. All things for himself. Yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. God has created you for him. So, look. God even said it in John 15. We are created for Him. To give Him glory. Hey, John 15. <clears throat> Let me try to find it here. Verse number 8. He said, Here is, a herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. You see that we are created unto good works for God. Now Jesus talks about abiding in Him. Right? <clears throat> but I get it, church. I've been there. I know. It's difficult to do that when you're not inspired to do it. When you're not inspired to go out... And, and, and be in church and go out and preach the gospel, it's difficult. It's difficult to abide in Christ. But look, inspiration is a poor fuel source for your aspirations for God. Inspiration is a poor fuel source for your aspirations for God, your desires for God. <clears throat> what are you going to do when you're not inspired, Christian? Huh? Are you going to do what you want to do instead of what you should do? Let me tell you something. If you decide to do what you want to do, you are birthing something in your spirit that's going to plague you forever. Forever. Oh, but even if I make a decision one time, you want to know why? It'll plague you forever. Because once a quitter, always a quitter. Once a quitter, always a quitter. <clears throat> Look, we've seen it. We've seen people come to church, get excited, come in here. Oh, man, free material. Man, I've been listening to Pastor Anderson online. They get excited. They come here. They come, they come, they come, and then they don't come. And then you don't see them again. And you're like, what happened? The first step, doing what you want to do instead of what you should do. Okay, if you take anything out of this sermon, take that. Take that. But this leads into my third point. Okay, we're getting to the finish line here. Let character or discipline do, do it until joy takes over. Let character or discipline take, uh, uh, do it until joy takes over. Okay, you're there in Proverbs chapter 16 still, right? Look at verse number 3. Just one verse back. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Do you see that? Let's read that again. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. What's that mean? No, no, you go ahead and do the work. I don't want to do it. It's just not. No, no, you go ahead and do the work. Ah, no, I don't know. You go ahead and do the work, and your thoughts will be established. Before you know it, the more you work, 
the more your joy comes back. Okay? Now, look, allow me to inspire you to do the work. Turn to Psalm 126 for me. Psalm 126. <clears throat> Did you know when you got saved that <clears throat> God has given you much? Did you know that when you got saved? See, the Bible says, For unto whom so much is given, of him shall much be required. You know that? See, God gave us something known as the Great Commission. It sounds big. It's a big task. That's much. Okay? That's much. God gave us the Great Commission. God told you to go out and preach the gospel. God said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's you. Oh, well, you know, I don't have that gift of evangelizing. It's not my gift. No, no, no. This is a commandment. God said, go ye into all the world. This isn't 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he's talking about gifts. This is God, this is Jesus Christ, in the book of Mark, telling you to go. Okay? It's your responsibility, church, to go out and preach the gospel. It's your responsibility, Christian. <clears throat> if you don't say anything, then you're selfish. See, the Bible says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. That's what the Bible says. Don't hide the gospel. Don't do what you want to do and stay quiet. Oh, I'm just not really good at speaking. Hey, do the work. Your thoughts will be established. Look, it can't be done without you. It has to be done with you. That's the way God set it up. There's no shortcuts to this. There's no easy way out. Where to go out and preach the gospel. See, the Bible says, How then shall they call on him whom they not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Hey, look, when you got saved, you were automatically a preacher. Not all of us are able or capable to do this right here behind a pulpit. But we're all called to preach. Man, woman, boy, girl. All of us are called to preach. How can you hear without a preacher? So uh, let's get back to this false prophet. This same guy. The same guy says, hey, tracks can get people saved. He's giving out tracks, saying people can get saved. A track's not going to get anybody saved. You can't get saved without a preacher. Look, I have a tract right here. They're pretty cool. They say, biblically correct, not politically correct. That's an enticing track. If I got that tract and I wasn't a Christian, I'd come to church. Man, I'm not getting saved from this. This inspires me to go to church, and a soul winner like you will come up to me and give me the gospel. Hey, when I got to this church, a soul winner came up to try to give me the gospel. We're called to do that. We don't take shortcuts. It doesn't work. It's not what God designed. Okay? <clears throat> we got to have the right spirit, though. We got to have the right spirit because the Bible says to have compassion. In the book of Jude, it says, And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. If, hey, if you're not going to do it for God, because God told you to do it, can you at least do it because you love people? You realize that there are people that are going to hell 
And if you don't open your mouth, they're still going if God doesn't send another soul winner. Okay? Allow me to inspire you to do the work. Okay? Now, there are going to be times in your life where you're sad, but the rewards will bring you joy. Look, you're there in Psalm 125, or 26. Look at verse number 5. It says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You see that? Look, the rewards of it can bring you joy. Last place I'm going to have you turn, go back to John chapter 15. So if you want to continue to have joy, you need to bring forth much fruit. You need to make soul winning a priority. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I can guarantee you some of you get tired. I can guarantee you. But let me tell you something. When you go out soul winning, and I've gone out soul winning with almost everybody in the church. When you go out soul winning, at first you're like, man, I don't know, I feel like going. Hey, Brian, can you knock this first door? I'm just... I'm tired today, man. Just knock this first door for me. And then he knocks the first door, and you go a couple of doors down, and then people get saved, and all of a sudden, you forget about all that. You're joyous. And then afterwards, you guys have conversation, build friendships, bond. God gives you joy. Look at verse number 11. It says, These things have I spoken unto you. It's like Jesus knew that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. You see that? Don't lose your joy, Christian. Don't do what you want to do instead of what you should do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this church, Father. It really does feel real good to be back in church, Lord. Lord, I just pray for Pastor Bergens uh, as he goes up and preaches, Father, that you fill him with with your power and with your spirit, Lord, um, that he could be able to preach with boldness, Father. But Lord, I just pray for us as well, Father, that we get home safely, Lord. Protect us from anything out there, Lord. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege to be able to go out and preach the gospel to those that are lost. Allow us to open our mouths and bring people to Christ and work alongside with you. We love you, Father, and we do this only for you. We wouldn't do it for any other reason. Lord, we love you, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.